الواحد متنكد يعني مصدر رزقه لما نشوف مصدر رزقه بسكر قدام ايش يسوي؟ حسب الله وانت نعم الوكيل. العوامل التي انتجت الحرب الاخيره في غزه لا زالت قائمه ويمكن ان تنتج صداما جديدا في اي وقت. We've just crossed in into the Arab border crossing in Gaza. It's the first time we've been here uh, since the war over the summer when things were in full swing. Last summer, Vice News was in Israel and Gaza covering the 50-day war. During the fighting, around 18,000 homes in Gaza were destroyed or severely damaged, leaving around 120,000 people homeless. Six months later, people are just beginning to pick up the pieces. It was the third major conflict in just six years, and the situation for people in Gaza grows increasingly dire. Even before the war, conditions were already grim. We headed straight to Sijaiya, a neighborhood that bore the brunt of the fighting last summer. During the war, the shelling was so intense that we were unable to enter the neighborhood, and nearly all residents had to flee. Ayman, one of the many residents who left, returned to find both his home and his business destroyed. What was it like here here during the war? Were you were you here? وطلعنا من البيت و... وهودنا على على البلد في مكان امين يعني و... فاجانا خبر بعد ثاني يوم عيد الفطر انه نهد بيتنا فكان شعورنا صعب جدا كثير كثير لما سمعنا هذا الخبر How have the reconstruction efforts been is anyone I mean has there been new concrete any new supplies that people have given you to help rebuild your home بس بالنسبه لل... للاعمار ما في اخبار عن الاعمار بالمرة يعني نهائي يعني في شيء في شيء ايش اللي يطمن انه في اعمار في بناء في يعني حتى تعويض يعني ما اعطوناش سوى اليو ان دي بي وشيء بسيط كمان يعني ومساعدات خفيفه يعني شيء بسيط To make matters worse, winter storms had recently hit Gaza, bringing near freezing temperatures. You know, in Shijaiya, this was really fierce fighting here. Um, it's known as a, as a hard neighborhood. And there's still a lot of anger here. It's, it's definitely tense. People are still really upset they've lost their homes. A lot of them have lost friends, family. Um, and you know, they're trying their best to sort of power through it. But uh, it's definitely still on edge over here. A family invited us into their home to show us how they've been living since the war. Can you explain to us what uh, what happened here? In the house, three houses and the How have the children been been coping? How have they been dealing since the war? كله يعني كل أطفال كلها مرضى شوف البرد اللي جا شوف المنخفض يعني فقدت ابن بنتي عمره خمس شهور من البرد ما حدش دور عليه ولا حد قال أخذناه على المستشفى قال مسقع مين دور عليه ولا حدا أي وش هذا زنبو هذا Her grandson is one of five Gazan children who have reportedly died from exposure over the winter The storms have wreaked havoc on those left homeless from the recent war So why has it taken six months for reconstruction efforts to begin? Since Hamas took control in 2007, the Gaza Strip's borders have been tightly sealed. Goods can only pass through a handful of crossings, and in the past 10 years, three of the six crossings have closed. Erez in the north is restricted to pedestrians only, leaving only two points of entry, Karen Shalom border with Israel and Rafah border with Egypt. Rafah used to be Gaza's busiest crossing, both for goods and people. In an open secret, 
Hundreds of tunnels ran from houses on the Egyptian side under the fence to Gaza and Rafa, bringing everything from cars to chewing gum, fish to fence posts, and, it was strongly suspected, weapons and material for the Gazan militant groups. But Egyptian Sinai is now home to Ansar Bayt al maqdis an Islamic State-affiliated group. On October 24, 2014, 33 Egyptian soldiers were killed in two attacks. In response, Egyptian President Abdul Fattah al-Sisi closed the Rafah crossing, blaming the attack on weapons and militants coming in from Gaza. Egypt also blew up over a thousand houses along a kilometer-wide area next to the border with Gaza, eliminating the smuggling tunnels. It's kind of eerie walking around here now. Um, all these tunnels were basically the only lifeline Gaza had for a while, where all sorts of goods came through, and now it's just completely shut down. At Rafa, a former tunnel worker agreed to speak with us about the consequences of the destruction of the tunnels. What did you do here? What was your job with the tunnels? Can you tell us what the situation was like here, uh, first under Mubarak, then under Morsi, and now under Sisi? Mubarak, Mubarak, كان يعني بتقدر تقول نوعا ما كان مسهل المسهل الإشي مسهل فيه نوعا من التسهيل. أيام مرسي خلى قطاع غزة عالم اقتصادي خلى قطاع غزة في انتعاش اقتصادي رسمي. سيسي دمار 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 غزة شل شل غزة هاي زي ما أنت شايف مسكرين لنفاق ودمر الدنيا. فيش خطورة إحنا أيد عاملة فيش لا سلاح لا بندخل سلاح. أكل وشرب وعدة وملابس اليوم بخش على المحل فيش المحلات مصانع صار في أغلبية المصانع سكرة لأنه كنا ندخل مواد الخام الواحد متنكد عن يعني مصدر رزقه لا ما نشوف مصدر رزقه بسكر قدام من أجي سو حسب من الله أنت نعمل وكيل. Egypt claims that the border was closed because weapons and Islamic militants were being smuggled into the country. But a contact close to Israeli intelligence told Vice News that any outflow of weapons and militants from Gaza into Egypt is not likely. Some suggest the border closure had more to do with internal Egyptian politics and combating the Muslim Brotherhood, with whom Hamas is affiliated. Either way, the closure has hit the Gazan people and Hamas hard. On top of administering a population on the verge of collapse, Hamas has lost huge tax revenue from the tunnel closure. We headed back to Gaza City to talk with a Hamas spokesperson about the border closure and the ceasefire with Israel. Can you just give us a general overview right now of some of the issues that Hamas is dealing with six months after the war? The Israelis have claimed that they really you know, stopped a lot of Hamas's military capabilities. They've destroyed all the tunnels. Um, we know that there have been some rocket launches recently. Is Hamas uh, in the process of rebuilding? Are they getting stronger right now? Hamas لم تضعف الحرب ولا زالت قوية ومن الطبيعة أن تستمر في سياسة التدريب وتطوير قدراتها لأن إسرائيل مستمرة في العدوان ومن الطبيعة أن نستمر في الاستعداد لمواجهة العدوان. العوامل التي أنتجت الحرب الأخيرة في غزة لا زالت قائمة. Last week, there was a, an attack in Tel Aviv on a bus. A number of civilians were, were stabbed. Um, does Hamas condone these actions? I mean, are, are these sort of things celebrated? لذلك المواطنين الفلسطينيين هم في حال الدفاع عن نفس ونحن أيد قيام المواطنين الفلسطينيين بالدفاع عن نفسهم في مواجهة الإرهاب الإسرائيلي. Hamas condoning such attacks angers Israel, but also raises tensions with their political rival Fatah, who run the Palestinian government in the West Bank. With different ideologies and affiliations, there has been bad blood between Hamas and Fatah for years, especially since Hamas took over the Gaza Strip. In 2014, they tried to bury the hatchet 
And as part of the new unity government, the Palestinian government, run by Fatah, is supposed to manage the borders with Israel and run government ministries, while Hamas has de facto power in the streets. Fatah have also refused to pay some Hamas workers. It's a complex situation that adds another layer to the problems facing Gaza. We used to say that the international community used to play and we pay. Unfortunately, during the last few years, some other players joined the game, which, uh, which is the Palestinians themselves, Hamas and Fatah. They uh, work for their own interest and the, the citizens pay the price of the conflict between, um, between them. And the, these people are innocent, they are not involved, they are irrelevant w w w w uh, regarding the, the conflict between Hamas and Fatah, but they are imposed to continue paying the price by suffering. So you have the Israelis and the Egyptians choking it off, and then Hamas, Hamas. and Fatah. We deal with four authorities. We have two governments, in, uh, de facto government in Gaza, and a government, uh, the Palestinian Authority in West Bank, Israel and the international community. Egypt also joined the game. So the Gazans deal with all of these main players and none of these players support them. After the war, the international community met in Cairo to pledge over $5 billion to get Gaza back on its feet. This immediate money will mean immediate relief, reconstruction. The United Nations Relief and Works Agency is one of the main UN organizations channeling international donations to provide aid to the people of Gaza. They provide shelter for those who lost their homes, distribute food, fund reconstruction, and run schools. We met with UNRWA spokesman Adnan Abu Hazna to find out why it's taking so long. The situation is getting, you know, deteriorating more and more here in the Gaza Strip, and we are you know, supposed to do the major work of, you know, reconstructing the shelters of the We received only $130 million from the pledge, which is about more than $5 billion right now. We asked for $724, $724 million. Right now we get, you know, less than 15% of, uh, of that. What's the psychological effect right now? Are you seeing a lot of trauma? How are people coping with that? It doesn't seem like there are many facilities to help people co uh, cope with, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder and all, all the things that they've seen, especially the children. The real damage for the Gaza, and this is what, what everyone, the psychological damage. A shelter or a road you can rebuild in one year, two years, but the, psycholo but the psychological effect, it will affect these kids for tens of years. And this is a real and major uh, problem. These kids are the leaders of the future. A few days after we met Adnan, the UN had to halt its cash assistance to displaced people because it ran out of money. How have the children been since the war? I know I see these houses are from the UN. Are you getting help from the government here, from, from Fatah, from Hamas? Is there anyone here helping you guys live your lives right now and get back to normal. As we were leaving Gaza, we came across a few people breaking down the rubble. Can you tell us what you guys are doing here? احنا هنا بنسوي الدور اللي قصفوها اليهود العمارات المباني بنكسرها وبنجيبها على الكسرات هنا وبنكسرها زي ما انت شايف بالمهدات وبنعمها بطون صغير وبنحنها على الكسارة بنطلعها حصمة ثاني. The concrete that you're making right now, what will it be used for after you're done breaking it down? بنبيح على المعامل اللي بلوك هما بدقوها ثاني بلوك أحجار وببعوها للدور اللي انقصفت. عاودوا يبنوها تاني كمان مرة ببنوها كمان مرة بعيدوا عمارها يعني بعد ما انقصفت من اليهود من جيش الاحتلال في حرب 2014 بنعود عمارها تاني With Rafah now closed, reconstruction materials can only enter Gaza from Israel, which frequently accuses Hamas of using the steel and concrete brought in to fortify its military positions instead of addressing the urgent civilian needs. Back on the Israeli side, 
we headed to the crossing at Karen Shalom to see what was being brought into Gaza. In Israel, there's a lot of concern about what type of goods are allowed through the crossing. We're here right now at the Karen Shalom crossing, which is right at the border of Gaza, Israel, and Egypt. And as you can see, a lot of these goods are going in right now for the reconstruction efforts. We've been told it's about 30% construction. We're seeing concrete, we're seeing timber. Uh, we were just told that 400 to 500 trucks are going in a day. The question is, is that enough for 1.8 million people and for all the destruction that was caused over the summer. In fact, the UN says that to cover just housing reconstruction and repair, it needs 735 truckloads per day, seven days a week, for three years. Even so, the goods entering Gaza are still heavily monitored, and construction materials face long bureaucratic procedures to get clearance. Other materials, like machine parts, are also considered dual use, so something for fixing a power plant might be restricted as it can be used to make rockets. We're mostly being shepherded towards the construction materials. They know that that's an issue, it's a controversial issue, that there's not enough being brought in to help rebuild the city. Uh, and it's pretty clear that our guides here uh, want to make sure we film as much of that as possible. We're going to talk to an officer in Kogat, which is the coordinator of government activities in the territory. It's the Israeli agency that handles all the civilian crossings and everything that necessitates that. So basically, they're the ones overseeing all the goods that are going through and the goods that are coming out of Gaza. We saw a bunch of truckloads of goods going in today. Um, what's, the, what's the process like for those goods that go through? What's the security in place? Who checks it? You know, what, do you, what do you check out? Generally, today, all goods are allowed to go to Gaza. There is a small list of goods which has to be checked before getting the clearance to go inside Gaza. Other goods are getting clearance in five minutes. They just ask the list every day, and if it's humanitarian goods, food, uh, other goods which can be used for civil purposes, they don't need much clearances or coordination. They just go to the crossing after we get the details and being transferred to Gaza. But there's still, I mean, there's still like a sort of quota of goods that are allowed in, no? No. Except the goods which are, can be used for military purposes, all goods are allowed with now special clearance. The lengthy process at Karen Shalom pushes up the cost of the goods, more so than if they came through Rafa. But with the war still fresh in everyone's memory, Israel fears supplying material that could be used for military purposes. One of Hamas's major military successes during the war came from a network of tunnels dug into Israel that were used by militants to launch attacks on soldiers and communities along the border. <laughs> The discovery of the tunnels had a dramatic effect on Israeli border communities. We met up with Captain Elbo, a medical officer with the Israel Defense Forces, to get a closer look at one of the tunnels the IDF discovered during the war. This is one of the uh, best built tunnels. Uh, you can see all the ceilings, floor, walls, everything is uh, made by uh, concrete, very well yeah, built. it's reinforced, it's really Extremely heavy. Extremely reinforced, duty. yes it is. Uh, as I said, Hamas is a learning organization. We, they had a few tunnels that collapsed. We know about people that were killed during the digging processes inside the strip, and they've learned from it. Now they're building it much better uh, for it not to happen again. Let's go inside. Do we know where the concrete comes from? Where does yeah. it originate? This is an Israeli concrete. We found even uh, bags of cement written in Hebrew in this tunnel. It was, it was bought from Israeli uh, factories to the strip in order for them to use it for normal purposes. But they have decided to um, invest all these um, resources in those tunnels. So, uh, you know, it's pretty ironical, but that's what actually happened. Seeing this concrete that's being used, how do you feel about the reconstruction efforts in Gaza? Obviously, we know there's, there's tens of thousands of people there that are homeless, that are freezing, that have nothing. Um, but then you can see here, some of the concrete that was brought in before, maybe for reconstruction, was used to build these tunnels. How do you, how do you rectify that situation? Hamas is cynically using a lot of money to build those amazing tunnels instead of investing this money in his own people. And uh, I can tell you that we know that most, if not, if not everything, most of the things that are going inside the strip nowadays, as we speak, don't go to the um, people inside the strip. They go towards new tunnels, towards new bases of Hamas, towards all the military purposes. And this is extremely sad for me. So what are, we, what are we seeing right over here? Uh, this is the neighborhood of Khan Yunis. Okay. Uh, that's a neighborhood in the Gaza Strip in which uh, the tunnel, this one, uh, has been uh, dug from. And Khan Yunis was hit very, very hard during the war, right? It was leveled. 
Uh, I don't know about uh, the amount of, uh, of uh, danger, of, of um, uh, heat. I do know that we aimed only for the Hamas purposes, only for the Hamas targets in the tunnels. You know, these neighborhoods were destroyed for the most part. Um, I don't know what the military purpose was, but they were, they were hit pretty bad. You know, it's a very problematic issue. We have a four, year, four years old child, a very cute one, that was killed by, by a, a, a rocket fired from a UN school in the strip. So, you know, as far as it concerns the international law, wherever you are being fired from is a legitimate purpose. We are not attacking most of it because we don't want to harm innocent people. But still, there's a lot of concern. I mean, the Palestinians are going to the ICC right now, you know, to accuse Israel of war crimes, and Israel's trying to stop them. They don't want to go on trial for it. I have no idea about it. I am a medical officer who saved the terrorist. That's all I know. That's all I was doing. I saved life for everybody. That's what the IDF is going to, for. And I have to say, my own opinion, we are the most moral army in the world. Whoever says otherwise should be checking himself. That's my own opinion, but I have nothing to do with this thing. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So we're here in Nahal Oz, which is the closest Israeli community to Gaza. And over the summer war, there was an infiltration here by Hamas commandos. Hamas filmed the operation where they came up through the underground tunnels and surprise attacked the IDF base in Nahal Oz. They killed five Israeli soldiers and were able to escape with their weapons. Gail is a resident of the Nahal Oz kibbutz across the road from the IDF base. While the community may seem quaint, the schools are reinforced with concrete barriers to protect from rockets and mortars. It's also protected by a number of security fences and cameras. The scale of devastation isn't close to what we saw in Gaza, but the residents are still traumatized by the war. Last summer, a four-year-old boy in Nahaloz was killed by a rocket attack. The boy that was killed here, I think he was four years old, Daniel. Uh, was that really close by here? Yes, it was. I don't know, um, 400 meters from my house. Was he, was he running to his house? Was he inside the house? He was inside the house. And because there was a lot of falling before, um, they went to the safe room out and, and in and out. And then his parents decided that they will go out. It was Friday uh, to the family and leave the kibbutz again until it will be ceasefire again. Uh, and they're actually packing. Um, and they started to put the things in the car. And then there was the red alert. And because they have two little brothers, his two parents took the little brothers to the safe room. And they trusted him that he will run also. Uh, they didn't get to the safe room also, but Daniel was standing next to the window. And he was dead immediately. Um, I, I, I cannot imagine something. Do you think it's reaching a sort of breaking point where people are starting to realize that maybe a military solution isn't the answer? Yes. I think now it's the point. After the second military operation, we thought the, the next one will be the last one. Now we know it's not the last one. So we ask how many times, how many rounds, and what we will lose on the way. When, when you lose a kid, you start to think about everything over again. Over again. Um, and you have to think if it's worth it. And there's no explain in the world that said it can worth it. It's not. Gail is taking us to the main security fence that's around the entire kibbutz. So you can see right up over here, uh, that balloon looking thing, that's an observation camera uh, that sort of surveys the territory right here. Because we are so close and we don't have enough time uh, to alert us if there is a rocket falling, if the camera sees that there's something suspicious next to the border, they let us know by our cell phone. And then we know to go to the safe room, to stay next to our houses, to bring our kids back home. We have to be with cell phone all the time because this is our, uh, our way to know what's about to happen. And how often do those alerts come? If this quiet right now, we hope we, went, we didn't get any for days, for weeks, for months. But uh, during war time or the days before, it can be every 20 minutes, every hour, every two hours, all the time. During the night, during the day, all the time. You continue to live here with all these threats. I mean, when you speak to people in Gaza, they say we have nowhere else to go, otherwise we will leave. You guys have a choice to stay here. Why do you end up staying here even with all this happening? This is my home. It's always been my home. And when I was a child, I remember Gaza Strip different. 
I remember time when I used to go to Gaza Strip and I used to eat there and to do shopping over there, to go to the beach over there. And I think I'm waiting here in this point for this, for this area can, can, that could happen again. I really believe it could happen again. I cannot see it right now. I know where I'm living, but I really hope that one day it will happen. And when it will happen, I want to be here. And you wanted to show us this particular point. Is there a reason for that, this point in general? There's 800 meters between their first houses to our first houses. It's a point at which I love to come because I really hope one day we can go over this fence and just enjoy one each other. Gail's voice of optimism is rare. The IDF and Hamas are busy rearming, already preparing for the next war, even while still dealing with the fallout from the last. The humanitarian situation in Gaza continues to deteriorate, and many say it's worse than it's ever been. Egypt has closed the vital lifeline, while Israel maintains a tight grip on people and goods entering and exiting. The international community hasn't delivered on its promises, and Palestinian political parties are beset by infighting. Meanwhile, the people of Gaza are left to pick up the pieces.